Today on Locked On Rockies, looking at a salary cap or salary floor for the Colorado Rockies. Let's be honest, it's probably not going to happen anytime soon in baseball, but would it really change anything for the Colorado Rockies? You are Locked On Rockies, your daily Colorado Rockies podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Rock on Rockies fans, welcome into the Locked on Rockies podcast for today, the 26th day of December in the year 2023. I'm your host of the Locked on Rockies podcast, Paul Holden, bringing you your daily Colorado Rockies talk right here on the Locked on Podcast Network, where you can find your team every day. If your team is the Colorado Rockies, guess what? You're in the right spot. That's what we do around here as we talk Rockies baseball each and every day, bringing you your daily Colorado Rockies talk here on your favorite streaming services or on the Locked on Rockies YouTube channel, where you can be part of the show and fire off your Rockies hot takes, letting me know what's on your mind when it comes to the Colorado Rockies. If you want to help the show, your subscription to the Locked on Rockies YouTube channel is the easiest way to help the show grow and puts a smile on my face. Just like that, <laughs> if you help the show out. Uh, I'm your Rockies fan extraordinaire, Paul Holden. been following this team my entire life, bringing you your daily Rockies talk now for over three seasons here on the Locked on Podcast Network. Uh, today on the show, we're going to talk about salary cap and salary floor. Also, Roxpile has a good little piece of uh, four prospects that should not be traded. So learn a little bit about a um, couple of uh, Rockies prospects. We haven't talked up a bunch or uh, uh, too much outside of maybe just one, but uh, learning a little bit here from Tanner Vote uh, from Roxpile. I hope I got that last name right, but uh, four prospects the Rockies should not trade. Uh, we'll be reading from here from Rock's Pile later on in the show. But uh, before we dive into everything today, I want to let you know that today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, a new customer get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's $150. If your team wins, visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. All right. Um, let's start. With salary cap versus salary uh, floor, here Wikipedia defines the uh, a salary cap or wage cap as an agreement or rule that places a limit on the amount of money that a team can spend on players' salaries. It exists as a per player limit or a total limit for teams' rosters or both. Several sports leagues have implemented salary caps, using them to keep overall costs down and also to maintain a competitive balance by restricting richer clubs from entrenching dominance by signing many more top players than their rivals. Salary caps can be a major issue in negotiations between league managements and players' unions because they limit players and teams' ability to negotiate higher salaries, even if a team is operating at significant profits and have been the focal point of several strikes by players and lockouts by owners and administrations. As you know, Rocky or uh, baseball does not have one and choose uh, instead opting to go for the uh, luxury tax, which we'll uh, we'll dive into. But basically, a uh, a salary floor is uh, basically says a team has to pay a certain amount. So. Would these benefit the Rockies? How when we sit there and say, "Oh, the Rockies need to spend more," or they need to go after some big name free agents so the Rockies don't spend money? It's kind of interesting when we say that because no, the Rockies aren't a top ten team in payroll, but they're not a bottom ten team. They're kind of right smack dab in the middle, or or just about there. Last year, the Colorado Rockies payroll had them at sixteenth. At one hundred and seventy-one million one hundred and eighty one hundred eight thousand seven hundred and seventy-eight dollars, and that puts them, uh, you know, look at the markets ahead of them and look at the places ahead of them in terms of of pair. This is for twenty twenty-three, by the way. The Mets at the top, the Yankees, San Diego, Philly, the Dodgers. Those are the top five, and then you go into the top six: the Angels, the Blue Jays, the Braves, uh, the Rangers, the Astros. And then uh, getting closer to the Rockies here, some teams that are kind of in the ballpark, at least winning about $10 million, 10 to $15 million or so uh, away from the Rockies. San Francisco, the Cubs, the Red Sox, the Chicago White Sox, St. Louis Cardinals, and then Colorado comes in at 16. So literally right smack dab in the middle there uh, when it comes to payroll. So, and then when you compare it, the Rockies only have, and and I know this might sound like a lot of money, but but think about it. A, a 
24 million dollars on your pay payroll is what a one two year three a two year three year deal with someone on a lower end or a short one year contract even close to maybe arbitration eligible deal and that would put the rockies up uh, with with similar payrolls with with san francisco with and, and close to houston close to putting the rockies in the top 10 so a salary cap isn't really going to help the rockies nor is the salary floor this is a team that will spend money but it's it's the evaluation of the talent it's the it's the willingness and loyalty that the rockies have have always had to these guys it's the that when when this conversation comes up it, it it's one that i don't think the Rockies nestle themselves into because the Rockies will be like, ah, oh, they're not right now. They haven't signed anybody. They haven't signed anybody, but they have to pay Chris Bryant more. They have to pay all of the extensions that Bill Schmidt brought up. They have to, and on top of this, they're going to have to get ready to start bringing, extending and bringing in some of these young guys. You're going to have to deal with Brendan Rogers. The Rockies are go if, if they like this core so much, if they really truly believe deeply in this group of players that they have right now, the money's only going to go up. I mean, you're to, to keep all of these these players that you're excited about around. They are going to have to be willing to spend money, and and I think with the Rockies, when we're thinking about this conversation, it's not that the Rockies don't spend money. It's the it's the fact that the Rockies don't spend money effectively, and they they show show over eagerness to overcommit to players. And I know that's what players want. They want the long deal, and they want the money. They Players at Chris Bryant's stage in his career wanted the, the Chris Bryant deal that the Rockies gave. They want and, and look at the deals that are being signed right now. 10 year, eight year, seven year, uh, you know, X million of dollars. That's the type of deals people are looking for. I think when it comes to the Rockies, they need to be better and more efficient there. They can't be so willing and immediately saying, All right, Antonio Senzatella. Here's that extension. Uh, truly deep down, the big contract extension players, uh, eligible players for the Rockies, when they brought one of them back, they traded him. And it seems like they made the right move in terms of not offering Trevor Story the big money in terms of his health and, and the players that they had in the system. But then, But then again, then the Chris Bryant deal comes up. And that deal's only going to hamstring you more and more down the line if you're not willing to dip in and spend more money on players. The Rockies could spend more money, but we can't sit there and say that the Rockies don't spend money because they have multiple times. And again, like we said, 16 ties pay, they're right in the middle when it comes to payroll. And it's a pretty big jump too. It's almost a $20 million jump from Minnesota to Colorado. Seattle making that jump uh, is at 137 uh, million and it, and it goes down. I mean, and it's pretty crazy. I, I think, you know, a lot of people are going to be sitting here and, and really wondering about the salary floor idea where a, a team has to pay a minimum because here's, here's my bigger thing when it comes to, to this topic. And, and it's again, I don't think the Rockies are, are really that bad of offenders. I think again, they're, too loyal and commit too long to players when they when they offer up money, but the Rockies will spend some cheddar. The Rockies will open up the wall a little bit more because because compare it to compare the Rockies payroll to to the bottom five here, or even let yeah let's do the bottom. Let's go to let's start at actually twenty two. Well, actually twenty one. Arizona made it to the World Series last year with one hundred and sixteen million dollar payroll. Washington right underneath it at one hundred and one. Uh, 101 million, and then Kansas City, 92 million, Miami, 91 million, Cleveland, 89 million, Cincinnati, 83 million, Pittsburgh, 73 million, Tampa Bay, 73 million, Baltimore, 60 million, Oakland, 56 million. Now you'll sit there and you say, well, Arizona and 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 uh, Baltimore, Tampa Bay, uh, those are all playoff teams. Miami flirting with, or I believe, making you making that wild card as well. Well, they're doing fine. What are they doing? They have a, di a completely different approach when it comes to, one, their attendance, two, the players that they uh, draft and develop, 
And three, how they approach and handle their team construction. The Rays are fully embracing this. We're not keeping players for longer than three years type of role, it seems like. You get three years of your favorite Rays player, they're out of there. They're getting, they're trading them before they have to sign the real big deal. And that's, and, and they've been able to make that successful and make it to the playoffs. Hasn't helped them win the World Series, but they've been able to navigate their tough stretches. Washington or Washington and Arizona now are teams that are going to be building up on their teams. Washington, a team that people believe on the, and Kansas City. Arizona, Washington, and um, Kansas City. Actually, I'm not too sure about Washington in this situation, so I'll remove them here. But both Arizona and Kansas City have been active this offseason building up those payrolls. So these teams kind of ebb and flow and fluctuate and, and what they're going to do, especially Arizona, they're going to have to figure stuff out as, as things get more expensive for them. But when I when when I look at this and when I look at big picture and and I don't know enough of the 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 analysis done, I get more worried about the teams that that try to scrape the barrel too too much to to, to go too little here, to have one two three four five six seven eight teams that spend under a hundred million dollars. I just don't think that's necessarily fair to those players. I, I don't necessarily think that that the that those teams are accurately paying the 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 some talent that they have on their on their team and remind you even with colorado's payroll they're, they're still they still have to pay nolan arenado they are still paying part of nolan arenado's contract it's it's not going to be the biggest deal on on the rockies books this year but it's still something they're going to do I, I don't know really what the the answer is here especially after this offseason um between salary cap and salary floor i, I because uh, I, I tell you what, we're running a little long in segment one. I'll tell you why I'm not. I, I don't. I don't have my mind made up about the two of them here coming up in segment number two. Before we do that, though, I got to tell you about some of our friends that help make this show possible, and that includes FanDuel. FanDuel's got you covered for all your NFL postseason action. Looking like we're unfortunately not going to be betting on our Broncos in the postseason after that stinker on Christmas Eve. But you know what? That's all right. You can still believe in your other teams, your other favorite teams, and score at FanDuel. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's $150 if your team wins at FanDuel.com slash locked on. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. If you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get in on the action. The app is super easy to use, and there's a wide range of betting options, including spreads, player props, over-unders, and more. So don't miss out at FanDuel.com slash locked on for that $150 in bonus bets when your team wins. FanDuel.com slash locked on for all the action this NFL season. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. This is the Locked On Rockies podcast for free and streaming on your favorite streaming services, bringing you your daily Colorado Rockies talk right here on the Locked On Podcast Network, where you can find your team every day. We were talking about the salary cap and the salary floor there in the first segment, and uh, really was, uh, I, I'm, I still kind of get confused and, and up in the air here, because deep down and truly, just because you spend a lot of money on a baseball team doesn't mean that it's going to win. And just because you hyper analytic, super focused, money ball, money ball, money ball, money ball, we have got it down to the science and the numbers. We can make this a bare bones paid roster full of success. I think baseball is weird in the fact that it, it, it shows that there's no true answer right here. Because again, let's go to the, the back to the highest payrolls in 2023, and let's let's see how long it takes us to get to the World Series champions who were criticized for spending a bunch of money to get there. Let's go. We're going to go through the list again, and we'll see how long it takes us to get to the Texas Rangers who won the World Series last year. The Mets are at number one. The Yankees are at number two. San Diego's at number three. Phillies at number four. The Dodgers are at number five. The Angels at number six. Toronto at seven. Atlanta at eight. And finally, Texas comes in at nine hundred and ninety five million dollars, mind you. But Texas spent one hundred and ninety five million dollars on their team last year. The Mets spent one hundred three hundred and fifty three million dollars on their team last year. The Yankees, who had a historically bad season for the Yankees, spent two hundred and seventy six million dollars last year. San Diego still messed up, you know, still in their issues. Two hundred and forty eight million dollars. 
Philly, $243 million. The Dodgers, $222 million. The Angels, $212 million. Toronto, $209. Atlanta, $203. So, yes, playoff teams, right. Great teams, yes. But a lot of these teams fizzled out. A lot of these teams, some of these teams didn't even make the playoffs. So just because you spend all this money doesn't mean you're going to be great. And just because you fold money ball, it doesn't mean you're always going to be in the mix. The downfall of these of the low payroll payroll teams are they're going to have to fully capitalize and, and, and really dominate small windows, small, small windows of opportunities, whereas the Dodgers can buy their way into 10 years of Shohei, 10 years of, of Yamoto, which we haven't talked about. And, and, and that's, that'll be full circle here. The Dodgers are going to be a great team next year. Really good. And they're probably not done. They will probably spend more money and they got creative with the deferred money for Shohei. Doesn't mean they're going to win the World Series. It, it, it simply doesn't. And I, I just don't know if if the luxury tax is, is necessarily going to be something that really impacts these biggest clubs. Uh, the luxury tax defined uh, here on Wikipedia, an arrangement in which teams whose payroll total exceeds a certain figure determined annually are taxed on the excess amount in order to discourage large market teams from having a substantially higher payroll than the rest of the league. The tax was first instituted in 1997 and is paid to the league and then puts the money into its industry gro growth fund. Um, let's see. These are only up until 2017. So this is uh, some of these numbers are out of there. But I, I just don't know if that necessarily does enough. They're they're never really going to uh, – they're never really going the, – the, the Yankees, the Dodgers, the big-name teams are are never really going to, to, to make it uh, – are never going to worry that much about this about this tax. They'll just pay it. They 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 will just pay what they need to pay and handle it if to get the players they want more often than not. And the players don't really like are are, are not really big on a a salary floor and uh, has never really been uh has never been received properly. So I don't know what the answer truly is here, but it does circle to this just because the Dodgers will dominate next year, but that doesn't make them the most, they're, they're not going to just be the dom most dominant team because they spend money. You have to spend money and then make that team work together. You have to spend money and find the pieces and, and hope that they stay healthy. You have to spend money and hope that team gels and works together or else it gets blown up and you look and, and you have to relook at it and say, Sheesh, that's a lot of money, and that's a lot of commitment. So when the Dodgers are doing this, when the Dodgers continue at the pace that they're at right now, at a point it's not going to become sustainable. A point that they're going to have that they're going to deal with, especially at, 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 that's coming now. Well, how how do the Dodgers really handle their rotation? Are they going to be able to make deals enough with their veteran guys to and their young, exciting pitching prospects to bring it up? The Dodgers get the benefit of being a machine and a deep farm system, and they can kind of churn over that. But again, just because these teams in the NL West have, have spent money and brought new players in and improved, looking at Arizona, looking at San Francisco, bringing in uh, the, the guy from the KBO, it's good that they are, are spending. I, I believe that it's good the players are making the most amount of money possible because they if this is what the market is, if this is what the best players are, are being paid, the players themselves should be able to take advantage of that and make their money. But it, I, I'm not going to sit here and immediately say, next year we know for sure it's the Dodgers' year. We know for sure everything's going to work out in Arizona again. We know for sure that San Francisco is going to be able to build with this with this new corner piece, with this really exciting guy. They certainly can. They They, they certainly have the possibilities to. They certainly have rosters to back it up. But until the end of the season rolls around, until we go through spring training and 162, we can't just sit here and only buy into high-level paid teams are always going to – they're going to win the regular season. They, they are. That's – when you're when we're having this conversation about salary cap versus salary floor, teams spending more, the regular season is always going to be better for those teams that spend more money. Maybe I guess the Mets is, is the exception in San Diego. Probably th those two would be ones that you could point to as recent frustrations and say, hey, that didn't work out. 
But wouldn't you be more wouldn't you be more optimistic about your team if you had an owner that's willing to do what the Mets owner did, willing to do what the Padres owner did, willing to do what the Dodgers owner did has done this offseason? Or do you want to be a Tampa Bay Rays fan and you see you get attached to a player and you get excited and then they're traded three years later or they don't resign them or they do all these other shady moves? Not shady. I, I don't shouldn't put that shady. Cost cutting, cost effective type of moves. I really think that you can see with the with the disparity in payrolls, you can really see the uh, the the interesting angles for both things there. But at the end of the day, when I look at it. I get frustrated that the highest paid teams and the teams with the most money can set the market because of what they have in terms of resources to give for players. But I can't be that upset when players are making the most money possible in their position as that's what anyone would want to do in their career. But in terms of fairness, in terms of competitive balance, in terms of do I think that this makes baseball worse or better compared to other sports that have uh, salary caps and salary uh, uh, and other salary implications. I just don't know. To be totally honest, I just I I think that it's it it. I don't have a clear enough answer. I don't really know enough of like really thinking of exactly what I want from these. Especially because when w I think you can sit there, uh, uh, different fandoms can sit there and and have different takes. You know the. Salary cap, you know, people on the high end, they can say salary floor, say, hey, spend more money. Your billionaire owners, they own teams. They can spend more money. And you got the teams at the bottom that say, hey, we're trying to make everything possible. We're fighting attendance. We're fighting our new media deals. We're fighting all of this stuff. And we're just trying to keep this team uh, together and keep solid talent, solid enough talent here. We need there to be a limit on what you guys are doing to give us a chance at some of these guys. But the Rockies, again, find themselves kind of smack dab in the middle and they don't really lean too strongly on either side. This is a team that doesn't spend money the best and most effective ways, but it's also a team that spends money here and there that will that that is that is more active or not or will extend and sign extensions of players for the, for this team. But right now what we're seeing is a Colorado Rockies team. I I I think they're just more searching for their direction search and and they and they believe in their core enough to say we're going to handle this money situation a little further down the road because i mean they're going to be running out of time here to to add to this team as the 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 hot stove should probably reheat again here after the holidays even though we got a christmas eve deal there for the the mariners i i just don't think that this is a team that the rockies can't don't really have a strong case either for a team that spends too much or too little when they're right smack dab in the middle of other teams, I think for the Rockies, it's more of finding ways to spend that money effectively and investing not just on players in the field, but continuing to invest in things outside of the field to help make your team better. Because the other things that they're not telling that, that the salary cap isn't really factoring in is how much money that the team is investing into their own development, their own resources, their own facilities, their own uh, faculty and X, Y, Z. And that's where the other rich teams get the benefit there. They have the access not only to pay the players, but they also have the access and resources to pay the best analytics people, to pay people to stay, to, to people for people to stay in the organization that aren't just playing game, the uh, playing the game. It's a tough one, though. It really is. I mean, uh, baseball is weird. There, there's certainly a conversation because again, the 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 difference last year between Oakland's payroll and the Mets payroll was almost $300 million. The difference was $220 million between Oakland and the Yankees. And I know Oakland's a different story, but even Baltimore, the playoff team, I mean, $216 million behind the Yankees. I mean, and Baltimore's already come up, and we've already heard what Baltimore's owner's plan is for, for <laughs> there are, he was already getting out and saying, I don't think we can extend all these people. I don't like that. I do like the Rockies rewarding good play for lo and 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 having players be loyal Rockies, but I don't always like the way that the Rockies handle the numbers on the books. So, all in all, salary cap, salary floor, really really tough uh, kind of conversation there, and there there's solid points either way.
I uh, am not a numbers guy. I'm not an economics guy, you know, so so I'm just kind of giving my my takes here. I'm sure out, y'all out there uh, that that know the numbers game uh, more than I probably have, have better takes than, than me. I, I, I just think I'm in the camp of we, we can't really say the Rockies spend a lot or don't spend a lot when we look at them compared to the rest of the league. And just because you, you spend big doesn't mean you're always going to win big, but it certainly, certainly helps your chances. And it certainly helps your team in the regular season and makes them a, a, a better force there in the regular season. All right. Um, I, uh, rocks pile had a good little look at four prospects that, uh, the Rockies should not trade as they're uh, figuring out which prospects, who's going to get traded, and how do they build up on this team. Let's talk about that coming up in segment number three. This is the Locked On Rockies podcast for free and streaming on your favorite streaming services, bringing you your daily Colorado Rockies talk right here on the Locked On Podcast Network and on the Locked On Rockies YouTube channel where you can be part of the show. Really, really do appreciate you guys making us uh, your first listen of the day. Hey. Locked On has launched the first ever National Sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. Go to Locked On Sports Today on YouTube and subscribe to the first ever National Sports 24-7 streaming channel. Hey, over on Rock's Pile here, they have four prospects the Rockies should not trade by Tanner Vote here on uh, rockspile.com. And I wanted to uh, highlight because there, there are two names here, and I was especially intrigued by this, uh, this headline here. These two bats will be the cornerstones in the Rockies' offense. Robert Hallez, who uh, Rock's Pile here writes, the 18-year-old is listed at 6'2 and 202 pounds, already a physically mature kid. MLB Pipeline who was the number 24 international prospect this year and gave him 55 grade power, stating this team has potential to have plus raw power and be a plus runner. That's exactly the type of build that I want to hear. And, and uh, Cole Carrig also is a name that uh, falls into that. Uh, Carrig, like Calas, wasted no time showing his potential, slashing 350, 408, 600 between rookie ball and single A Fresno. He also hit five home runs and stole 13 bases, flashing his power-speed combination. That's what we're looking for for the Rockies. I, I really think batters with speed, batter defenders with speed, the Rockies are going to be someone that are really going to benefit from uh, – this type of player, this type of uh, this type of build, this type of, of of characteristics are what I love. I like it. I like a Brenton Doyle with a better bat. I like speed and I like it with offense because I really do think the Rockies need to be like the D-backs in a sense of they need to have they need to be more aggressive on the base pass. They need to get faster and they need to be able to move runners along by doing things like hit and runs, like bunts, like slapping singles, like doing things to move runners and be aggressive. So if the Rockies got two guys working up through uh, through the uh, the system there that fill that uh, that 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 fill that profile, that's going to be massive for the. Uh, for the Rockies here and going back to rocks pile here uh, reading from uh, Tanner's piece here. Uh, Carrig is a plus defender and has a lot of versatility, spending time in center field, his natural college position, shortstop and catcher playing those three positions at a solid level shows you how the, how athletic this kid is. MLB pipeline.com gives him some pretty impressive grades with 50 grade hit tools, 60 grade run and 70 grade, uh, 70, 60 grade run and 70 grade arm. Whew. That's going to be uh you like to, you like to see that you like to hear that that's really uh really really great. This one kind of surprised me here. Chase Dollander, uh, the Rockies' number one uh, number one pick here in uh, the twenty twenty three draft. Three, you can't uh, you can't be trading the guy that you just took first overall, especially someone uh, with a uh, with a pitch mix there with a with a multiple pitch mix and with the stuff that that people say he's got the elite the elite level stuff course control is the uh the 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 big issues here but uh let's see here what uh tanner has to say about uh dollander towards the end here now i'm just pair i'm just reading some stuff so you guys again rockspile.com for prospects rocky should not trade dollander has the pitch mix of a future ace with mlb pipeline pipeline standing he continued to display frontline starter stuff in 2023 with an elite fastball and very solid slider. He also possesses a curveball and changeup that are reported to be at least average offering. 
Dolliner should quickly should make his major league debut in 2024 and has the potential to move relatively quickly. He has the upside of an ace for a team that has desperately lacked a true ace for a long time. A lot was invested in a Dolliner, and the Rockies will be wise to keep him for as long as possible and reap those awards. Yep, you got to go with him if he's going to be your uh you know, number one pick, uh, number one pitcher. Uh, and then they uh, go with your Sean Sullivan uh, with the uh, the next pick in the draft. So uh, here's uh, here's what MLB pipeline has to say. His rank. He is ranked among the NCAA division leaders in strikes per uh, strike walk ratio and whiff rate, dis despite relying almost solely on a fastball that parks around 90 miles an hour, peaks at 95. And hitters know it's coming because he throws it nearly three quarters of the time. But they still can't touch it because his he uses his six foot four frame to deliver it from a low release height and wide angle that produces tremendous carry up in the strike zone. I like that, but I'm not going to lie. Low fastball velocity that that teams can expect a, a low fastball velocity and use at an increased rate worries me a little bit. But hey, I like it. I like the Rockies draft. I like the pitcher heavy focus. I like the fact that they went college pitchers. So we'll see. But uh Thank you, Rocks Pile, for, for giving us an update on some on some prospects there. Really read up more about that. Go check it out, rockspile.com for prospects the Rockies should not trade. All right, folks, that is going to do it for today's episode of Locked on Rockies. Thank you so much for joining us and, and for tuning in today. Winding down the year here on Locked on Rockies. We'll keep talking Rockies baseball. Take, keep taking your comments and diving into more Rockies topics here on the Locked on Rockies podcast, where you can get your daily Colorado Rockies talk right here on the Locked on Podcast Network, where you can find your team every day. Don't forget about that Locked on Sports Today 24-7 streaming channel available to you on the Locked on Sports Today. And for your second listen, you got Locked on MLB, or you got Locked on Broncos, Locked on Avalanche, Locked on Nuggets, and Locked on Buffs, taking care of you here for more Colorado sports coverage. Until next time, I'm Paul Holden saying so long from the Locked on Rockies podcast.